Milwaukee was settled by water and built on water. I mean, there was a reason. At one point, we had more grain silos and moved more grain through Milwaukee than Chicago did. The lakes used to be like the freeway, if you can imagine. Many, many ships. The schooners were the semi-trailers of the day. As a historian, you look back on why Milwaukee is Milwaukee and the Great Lakes have so much to do with it. Lake Michigan is a bear when it comes out of the Northeast. You better get out of there. There are more than 750 shipwrecks in Wisconsin waters. There are new discoveries made every day. You go down the line and all of a sudden that wreck appears. And it's like, wow, these are time capsules. It's a moment frozen in time when they go to the bottom. Out of the 19 men, nine were killed, 10 were saved, and two were never found. We're trying to understand the characteristics of how the water is changing. So we're trying to understand better what is going to happen with the shipwreck. The lake lives. You get the sense that this is a massive body of water that is fame of song and story. Two guys that never were found are in there. They have to be. Well, shipping was on the Great Lakes was really the way we were founded. Buffalo to Milwaukee was an immigration path. Prior to the railroads in Chicago, um, Milwaukee was actually larger than Chicago and was really an immigration disembarkment point. And then, even after the railroads hit Chicago, it was the trade and the commerce using water as the, 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 as the interstate highway system. The lumber from the Upper Peninsula of Michigan going to Chicago, um, especially after the Great Fire to rebuild the city, was huge. And there's a lot of that kind of commerce going on in the Great Lakes. Water was the trade lane well into the, the, the 20th century on the Great Lakes. Once the interstate highway system developed and the railroads expanded a little wider into the Midwest region, the reliance on water diminished a bit. But really, it was the waterways and the shipping industry that built up and settled this, this region of the country using the Great Lakes. We still are a global trading port. We still trade all over the world by, by water and maritime as well as within the Great Lakes. You can take the open water diver to here, but you can also take the guy who does 300 foot dives yep. on a regular basis, and they're gonna love this ride. Yeah. Because yep. it's a really good one. It starts at 55 feet. You know, you, you jump into water, you go down, and there it is, right there. The Prince Willem is uh, one of the most dived shipwrecks around Milwaukee for a number of reasons. It's intact still. And also it's accessible to most people because the wreck starts at about 55 feet. We are very lucky in the Great Lakes because the water is fresh and cold. On the bottom it's usually always 40 degrees it doesn't change, so the shipwrecks are preserved. They don't deteriorate, they don't fall apart in, like, in, like in the ocean. Prince Willem V was a regular visitor to Milwaukee. It was on its third of what was gonna be another four voyages in 1954. 
um, when it left Milwaukee um, late in the afternoon. And as it headed out a, a mile and a half or so outside of the Milwaukee breakwater, it collided with a fuel barge. It was carrying fuel oil. This fuel barge actually punctured like a 20-foot gash in the side of the Prince Wall, and it sank. But before it did go down, the, the Coast Guard cutter Hollyhock from Milwaukee came out and, and made sure everyone was rescued. So there were no casualties during the, uh, the loss. What's really interesting about the Prince Willem historically was that it was actually built in um, 1939 near Rotterdam. And it was actually in the process in, during World War II of being converted into a vessel by the German Navy. And in 1944, as Rotterdam was under assault, and D-Day assault, the Germans actually sank it near Rotterdam to kind of slow the oncoming Allied forces. And it, was, it, it stayed there until like 1947 when it was raised, cleaned up, rebuilt, and put into service and trade, ultimately with the Great Lakes becoming its, its trading route. and I take scuba divers out on the Great Lakes to shipwrecks that have been here for hundreds of years. The reason I started diving is because I got really interested in the history of the shipwrecks and the stories behind the shipwrecks. I wanted to know more, I wanted to go see them, what's left of them. As divers, we get trained properly, and if you follow the proper protocol, it's a very safe sport. If you get ahead of yourself and do something that's not safe, then you can end up staying on the bottom forever. The Willie has lost a few divers, unfortunately. Some of them ventured inside and didn't find their way out and perish inside of the wreck. My advice would be get out, get certified, get experience, find buddies you can trust, you can dive with, and just have fun. These are time capsules. When you go down there and you see these wrecks, because it's, it's a moment frozen in time when they go to the bottom. It's the only place you can see them. It, there's no museums that have all these old wooden schooners. And there's schooners that went down in the 1800s that looked like the day they went down. Sometimes suddenly it'll hit you that, oh my goodness, all these people died on this wreck. Um, you're, you're very, you get somber a little bit about it and you, you deal with respect. We have a law in in the Great Lakes, you cannot take artifacts off of ships. So a lot of the ships still have artifacts on them. People from the East Coast, West Coast, from the ocean, they take things off of ships, so then there's nothing to see. On these ships, you can go and see still some china, you can see the wheels, you can balance on some of them. Mass standing upright. If they could raise them, they tried to raise them because they want to reuse them and sail them again. Prince Willem, they wanted to raise it, they tried to raise it, and it was just proved too difficult to do it. In some cases, it's incredibly expensive, and in other cases, sometimes in, in raising them, you disturb them, and they are filled in some cases with a lot of fuel oil. In some cases, it's more of a tomb situation. Let's keep it entombed and encased. about the age I was, about there. 
18, 19, something like that. For years, I was the youngest guy on a lot of the rigs we worked on. When the shipwreck was happening, were you, were you scared? Yeah, oh, of course. I thought, this is, this is not right. You don't go out and go to work and expect to drown. The dredge had no business being out there as far as I'm concerned, but who was I? I was just a young guy. Dredge number six. It was built uh, by Manitowoc Shipbuilding, and it was built to dredge. It was a pretty flat hulled vessel. Um, it had a big scoop on it. It was built for a company in Chicago, Fitzsimons and Connell, um, and it was used essentially to dredge channels. In 1956, the Oak Creek Power Plant was just being built by uh, Wisconsin Electric, and they were in the process of building four different units for that power plant. And what they wanted to do was deliver the coal by water with full vessels, full Great Lakes vessels. But the channel at the dock, and there was a turnaround area, wasn't deep enough to allow those vessels to be filled with coal. So the dredge's job, it was hired to do, was to dredge the channel at the Wisconsin Electric Plant in Oak Creek deep enough to allow a full vessel of coal to deliver coal. So it was May 23rd of 1956, and they were working late, but the wind started kicking up. All of a sudden, it just turned around. Boom, it comes come right out of the Northeast, which is the worst on Michigan. And at two o'clock in the morning, this thing decides to turn over. A guy cable that holds a bucket broke, and the bucket swung all the way over, and that's about 30 tons being shifted to one side. Fireman told me, he said, Jerry, get the hell out of here. It's time to go. So we jumped into the water. Finally come up, and I turn and look, and the bottom of that dredge is right there going over, and it rolled right over and went down. The crew of 19 had no opportunity to launch their, their uh, lifeboat, and uh, nine of the 19 perished as a result. Nine were killed. Ten were saved, uh, and two were never found. Till this day, they've never found them. Was a uh, one of the oilers and a second cook. When I got back to Chicago, I went to a couple of wakes of some of the guys that, and the one wife said, "Why the hell wasn't it you and not my husband?" And I went, whoa. <laughs> that was sad. How do you answer that back, you know? But I always say, it's, we're sorry. You know, it's just one of those things. Sorry for your loss. I started diving because I had this, uh, I just wanted to know it was on the bottom where I couldn't see the bottom. I'd walk out on my grandfather's pier as a little kid and I'd look through the water and you could see the ripples in the sand. And you wondered, what, well, what's over here where it's six feet deep and I can't see the bottom? I image shipwrecks and I make it so that Everybody else who doesn't get to dive on them gets to see what they look like. So sometimes I paint them, sometimes I draw them. Uh, a lot of times it's digitally on the computer. Car ferry is a, a pretty great wreck to dive from a dive standpoint. It's got such a great history. No one knew um, where the car ferry in Milwaukee was. It disappeared in October of 1929. 
it headed out, it got three miles out of port, and it headed north into 40, 50 mile an hour winds, um, and it was never seen again. We went and uh, we were looking specifically at archaeological evidence on the bottom so that we could answer that very question of how the ship went down. Many people do feel that when you mention the name car ferry that it was designed to transport automobiles across, but these particular vessels were designed to be able to roll sets of rail cars aboard and transport them across. They were owned by the individual railroad companies. And what we discovered was that uh, the rail cars had broken loose. There were a number of uh, rail cars that were off the tracks, that were sideways within the hull. So when those cars loosened and uh, started riding around within the, the hull in the waves, one broke through the side of the hull, pushing it out. Um, and that eventually led to uh, the sinking of the ship. So much water came in. It's like a war zone. It's just a big, uh, on the outside, it's, it's starting to cave in on itself and stuff like that. And you see torn apart rail cars and you see torn apart metal and sheet metal and then the bow is kind of se starting to separate from the rest of the ship. And, uh, and then uh, a ways off of the bow section is the pilot house, which is still standing on the bottom. You can still see the words Milwaukee written on it. There's always this conf conflict as to how many people were lost, and because there were no survivors, there was no one to interview, really, to be able to address how many people were actually aboard. And really because um, some people didn't report because they didn't feel that the ship was actually going to go out that day. So there's really no way of telling exactly how many people were lost, um, but we know that it was a quite substantial disaster in Wisconsin history. One of the few visible signs of the tragedy was a uh, lifeboat and uh, addition of some bodies. And one of the lifeboats was found with, with four of the sailors uh, with their life jackets on. So it tells you that they were able to get to a lifeboat, but that the conditions were so rough that they just were unable to survive. Amongst the debris in the lifeboat was a message case. And inside the message case was a note, sort of a note in a bottle. These message cases were standard issue to vessels of the time. And um, that indicated the exact time of loss of the ship because uh, the note was written and on the note it said, you know, this is in the hand of the purser. Um, it was substantiated that it was on the letterhead of the Grand Trunk Line and uh, so it was authenticated. It's always sad when not a soul makes it off of a shipwreck and that, that adds something to the, uh, to the experience of diving it. You know, we don't have pretty fish and we don't have reefs. We have shipwrecks. And that's, there's no place in the world that's got more, better preserved historic wrecks than the Great Lakes. These are some pictures of uh, Captain Ed, as he was known in the family. Edward was a captain, and he spent 45 years as a car ferry captain on the Great Lakes. This was from the Milwaukee Journal in 1938, talking about my great-grandfather, Edward E. Martin. The Milwaukee was purchased by the Grand Trunk in 1908, and Captain Martin came to service as a wheelman. He became second mate in 1909 and first mate in 1912, and in 1920, he succeeded the late Captain Thomas Trail as master of the Grand Haven. Mainly, you know, he had been serving on the Milwaukee for a number of number of years, and in 1927, he got commissioned to be on the Madison, and I'm just convinced that if he hadn't received that commission, which was his first captainship, that he would have been on the Milwaukee and would have gone down with the Milwaukee. And I probably wouldn't be sitting here talking to you if that was the case. Where are we going? 
to it. The wreck. Let's see. 3.3 nautical miles. Of course, is that jump over that crease in the chart there. Columbus had the same problem. 091.5. Now we are just outside of the main gap. This is the main gap between the Milwaukee Harbor and Lake Michigan. Our goal is the Prince Willem, which is about three nautical miles offshore and we'll be sampling every mile on the way out. So the Seki gave us what? 10.5? No. 9. 9. On the other side? Other side, 6.7. 6.7. So the Kuala mussels uh, started invading in Lake Michigan around 2003 and a substantial rate. And uh, when you see the shipwreck, you'll start noticing that in between the mussels, now you can have algae. So the algae are gonna be also attaching to there. And what happens is that you have organic matter now depositing into your shipwreck, it starts degrading it as well. So very slowly, but you start changing the characteristics of the surfaces. Three, two, one, sample. 12, 10, 50, number 10. Now we're going to deploy a remotely operated vehicle, or ROV, that we will use to collect samples from the bottom. We'll also use it to survey the shipwreck and see what kinds of changes have occurred since last time we were here. Here we are looking at the edge of the Prince Willem and uh, we're near a railing and you can see that the surfaces are largely encrusted with a growth which is mostly mussels. There are several ways in which the animals alter the shipwrecks and in the case of a shipwreck any alteration is permanent. Stressed by currents, for example, during a storm and pulled off, they will pull a small piece of wood along with them. Most of the shipwrecks in Lake Michigan are completely covered with quagga and mussels, and that is really causing the breakdown of the shipwrecks. Um, it's become accelerated. Really, our understanding of those ships also develops over time as new technology becomes available to us. We try to use that to really understand how these ships are, to monitor their, their status, and then also to protect them for ge future generations to come uh, visit and enjoy. to watch the weather. I'm very conscious of weather. And I'll notice something and I'll say, ah, storm coming up. It's gonna get tough on the Great Lakes. Then I think about them seamen. There's nothing there that we could find anymore. It would have to be buried or gone by now. But you still have that respect and you still have to be careful. Our job really is to remember those victims, the people that really dedicated their lives. This was a place that they worked, this was a place that they lived, and in many cases it was a place that they lost their lives. And so remembering them and uh, being able to tell their stories is very important. There's been just this, a lot of attention back to Lake Michigan, and I think what that makes us do is try to look back on the past and be able to look and see why Milwaukee was built. I think it's really important to understand how Milwaukee became, from a Milwaukee perspective, how we were so dependent on water to begin with. Today we're very recreation focused. We have a beautiful waterfront for, for that. 
But as the Dennis Sullivan, for example, sailing out of Discovery World, the three-masted schooner, tries to remind us. Those masts, those sails were common. I mean, they were the way people first came here, um, how goods first got here. And water as transportation is, I think it's the timeless concept.